Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining Youth Creating Changes Sparking Discussions panel. Um, we're incredibly excited to have you here today. My name is Simon Debesai, and I'm the chair of YCC's Grassroots Organizing Training Committee. I'll be moderating today's panel. Um, a little bit of context for those of you who don't know, Youth Creating Change is a social justice incubator that provides student activists with grant funding, grassroots organizer training, and mentorship. Over the past two years, we've supported over 45 unique social justice initiatives, held over a dozen organizer trainings, and have administered $8,000 in grant funding. Because we cannot hold an in-person social change conference today, we are putting, putting together a virtual one, made up of three panels, one today and two next week. Additionally, we're hosting a publicity campaign for every one of our YCC Fellows projects. Today's panel is focused on organizations that are sparking discussion in the community and with our elected officials to address prevalent social injustices. We'll be featuring MoCo for Change, MoCo on Climate, MoCat, the Museum of the Contemporary American Teen, um, and they, the specific museum is called FEAR, um, the Noma Nesio Project, and Connecting Cultures. Um, but before we allow our panelists to give their initial presentation, I'd like to introduce our facilitator, Delegate Jared Solomon. Delegate Solomon has been a lifelong advocate for social reform in his community. Previously an educator in Baltimore City, Delegate Solomon is one of the few elective officials to directly witness the adverse effect of social injustice on our students. Supporting policy focused on increased civic engagement among high school students, gun violence prevention, and increased early learning opportunities, Delegate Solomon's platform is certainly reflective of his roots in education and understanding of issues that plague us as students. Welcome, Delegate Solomon. Thanks, Simon, for the warm introduction. Uh, I hope everybody's safe and healthy and looking forward to a really fascinating conversation about the amazing work that, uh, that you all are doing today. Thank you so much. Um, so um, to, to begin, we will be having uh, each group who is in attendance to give a short presentation on what their project is and a little bit about what they've been doing. To begin, we'll be starting with Connecting Cultures, hosted by John David or J.D. Gorman. John David. Wow. I don't think I've ever heard Simon call me John David. I kind of like it though. Um, okay. So I am one of the leaders of Connecting Cultures. You can go to the next slide. Whoever's. Thank you. Our sort of, we are a discussion based group that focus on hosting these community dialogues in order to promote civil discourse between people and different of different beliefs within our community. And we see that the first step to solving any problem is to identify that it's there and then to have a civil discussion about it. If you break your arm and you don't admit that your arm is broken, you're never going to have a healed arm if you keep trying to walk around doing everything that you did with your broken arm. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So we sort of work in two, a two-step process. This first step is our interactive pop-up spin art, where um, it's like the little kindergarten spin art thing. The paper spins around really fast and you put colors on, but our sort of added level to it is each color would be a trait that somebody would identify with. So we have um, gender traits, we have religion, we have sexuality, um, generation, and a couple other things. Um, and so this was a really nice way to sort of start off these deeper conversations. It was a non-offensive way to bring up the topic of identity and how it affects your experiences in Montgomery County. So we got to see, um, it's also a nice little visual representation of, um, the diversity in wh whichever area which we were stationed. And another big benefit that we got from it was, it was great advertising because random people would come up and be like, what are you doing? Um, and then we talked to them about this. We'd start some, we'd spark some discussions right then and there. And then we would tell them that we're having another discussion two days later. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you so much. So this is, these are some images from our community discussions. Um, and these were really open and flowing and every topic sort of, every discussion changed based on who was there and what they wanted to talk about. Um, and we got into some really nice deep conversations and a lot of common ground was found between different sides on different issues. 
Um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you so much. So we sort of started um, when myself and Tasneem and our other leader, Sadiq, were seeing these injustices in our school and in Bethesda and sort of the broader community as a whole. And we sort of noticed that people aren't really talking to each other about their issues. They're talking about the issues, but they're only saying they're one side and they're not having any discourse between each other and they're not trying to reach any common ground. So then we were all accepted into the Lazarus Leadership Fellows Program where we launched this organization and then through YCC we were able to continue it and they were able to get us some help and last summer we were able to host five discussions and four pop-up art stations um, and we were supposed to have some towards the end of this year in our school through BCC, but due to complications with coronavirus, those events have since been canceled. Um, you can go to the next slide. Thank you so much. And sort of our goals now, um, as we look towards the future, is we want to work with other discussion-based groups like Safety from WJ. And we also, um, until this whole coronavirus situation, blows over, we want to try to adapt to this new normal and bring online community discussions the same way that YCC is incredibly adapting. And like, instead of canceling the social change fair, we're doing it online, which um, we're trying to take a play from their um, book. And we also want to establish a club at BCC to bring in younger leadership. So when Tasneem and Sadiq and I all graduate, um this club can continue and there's one more slide i think and these are just some informations on how this is just some contact points on how to get involved if you would like um to join this organization thank you so much thank you jd um just to clarify before we continue on to the next project um so you know, we have very brief presentations for each group, but that will transpose into a discussion with Delegate Solomon. And at the end of today's event, there'll be uh, an opportunity for you all, the audience, to submit questions um, to each, uh, to direct it towards anyone, whether it's Jared Solomon, um, any of the participants. And if you look at the bottom bar um, on your screen, there's a section that says, a button that says Q&A. Um, and feel free to submit questions at any time, um, especially if it's about, if it's pertaining to a specific uh, subject matter within each presentation, um, just in case you guys uh, don't forget, um, and we will get to those questions at the end of the at the end of uh, this whole presentation. So that's just a, a little bit of an update for any of you guys who are wondering. Um, with that being said, uh, thank you, JD, again, um, and we'll be moving on to the next project, which will be Moco for Change and their recent initiatives, and that will be presented by Lauren Pearl. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Pearl and I am the field director for the, uh, the field organization director for Montgomery County Students for Change. So please next slide. Hi, so Montgomery County Students for Change was founded in the wake of the Parkland shooting in 2018. We originated as MoCo for, uh, MoCo for gun control and since then we have planned the walkouts at we have planned walkouts in the wake of major mass shootings and have facilitated discussions with regard to the boundary study and climate reform. So MoCo for Change's three major values are gun violence prevention, climate reform, and social equity within our school system. Next slide. So as director of field organization, I helped spearhead the gun violence prevention lobbying day initiative. So what this included is we built a coalition of five plus progressive organizations, including but not limited to Montgomery County Students for Change, BCC for Gun Control, Walter Johnson Democrats and Whitman Students Demand Action and Maryland's Moms Demand Action. And with this coalition, we took about 50 students to lobby 17 senators and it's, I mean, 17 state senators and delegates about four gun violence prevention bills. Those bills consisted of the regulated, uh, the regulated firearms definition bill, the ghost guns ban, the long gun loophole, and the violence intervention program. And I'm going to go into each of those shortly. Next slide, please. 
So why these bills? So the regulated firearm definition, essentially what it did is it added the guns used in the Dayton, Ohio shooting to the list of banned firearms in the state of Maryland. This is incredibly important because assault weapons at the end of the day are far more deadly than your average gun for two reasons. First, they have the capacity to just shoot more bullets, and so therefore they have the ability to have more victims. But additionally, these bullets are just fired with so much more force that a bullet from an assault rifle is far more deadly. So, and this being said, we've seen that assault rifles are just far more commonly used in mass shootings. And so this regulated firearms definition, we were just trying to keep it up to date to include the guns used in the Dayton, Ohio shooting this summer. Our next bill that we talked about was the ghost guns ban, and this ban was more of a, pro a proactive measure because ghost guns are guns that are 3D printed. Um, you do not buy them. They are manufactured using 3D printers. And so the issue with ghost guns, even though we have not seen them used in the state of Maryland so far, is that they are not, they don't have a license number, so they cannot be tracked in the use of crime. Um, and they are incredibly easy and cheap to make. So it allows people to bypass background checks. And if these guns are used in crime, you cannot det easily determine the criminal if they abandon the weapon. So that's what we were talking about. The ghost guns ban is a proactive measure to keep Maryland communities safe. Next slide, please. Additionally, we lobbied for the long to close the long gun loophole. So what this means is in Maryland, we conduct background checks on a wide array of assault weapons. I mean, not on firearms. However, long guns were excluded from this for only licensed firearms dealers were required to do this, but this did not include gun shows. This did not include um, just transactions between friends and families or auctions. Like none of that was on the charts for the long gun loophole. So. What we did is the long we lobbied to close that long gun loophole so that anytime a long gun is sold, it has to go through the same backgrounds as any other system. Um, and we also lobbied for violence intervention program, for increased funding for violence intervention programs, which consists of going into schools to essentially at to talk to at-risk populations to prevent the to prevent gun violence before it even happens. And next slide, please. So what we accomplished in this lobbying day, we trained 48 activists to lobby, had contact with 18 state legislators, and promoted gun violence prevention legislation within the state of Maryland. Our long-term goals were to decrease gun violence within our state, connect Montgomery County students to their policymakers, have politicians place an emphasis on the youth voice, and increase youth activism. Next slide, please. So, we, consist we consistently have operations like this. This operation was made possible by Youth Creating Change. And if you would like to get in contact with Montgomery County Students for Change, here are your points of contact. We would love to have you. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren. That was a very um, informative presentation. Um, and again, if you guys have any questions during this time period, feel free to submit them through the Q&A section um, and we will get to them at the end. So uh, next up, we have MoCat. Museum of the Contemporary American Teenager. Um, that will be uh, presented by Anna Hoover. Hi, so I'm Anna and I'm a leader of MoCAT. And so this year's theme is Fear Itself. Uh, next slide. MoCAT stands for Museum of the Contemporary American Teenager. And it's an interactive museum full of a lot of different art. It's all student art and it's completely student run. Um, and so we have art like on canvases, painted on walls, sculpture, lots of different mediums. And our museum is located inside the home on the Bethesda Presbyterian Church property, which was occupied by the Reverend Chuck Booker. And then he moves and he really graciously lent us his house for this project um, with the condition that we would help him transform it into a safe house for people who are transitioning out of homelessness and housing insecure. So that, those are basically like our two goals. Uh, next slide. So all of our art pieces are centered around this year's theme, which is fear itself, which has become even more with COVID since we started this project back in December. Um, but our projects cover a variety of fears, mostly specific to teens, 
Um, so we have things like fear of missing out, fear of climate crises, fear of guns, fear of immigrating to America, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so that sort of allows us to like explore this topic that is relatively taboo and a lot of people don't like to talk about because it makes them feel vulnerable, et cetera. Okay, so next slide. Um, so our goals are to start a conversation about the fears that we have as teenagers and ways that we can convey them to adults and to each other and our community generally, um, to shed light on the fears that our peers have and help us, uh, I guess, gain a greater understanding for things that other people might be going through that we don't understand. Um, and to help us relate with each other and understand that like a lot of people are feeling the same things that we are and the same fears. And then, yeah, it's sort of similar to the second one, but to give perspective on fears that we might not have personally experienced. Uh, next slide. Okay, so this is a bunch of photos of our museum. Um, as you can see, it's not finished in these photos, um, but these are three art pieces. Uh, on the left, there's one about the fires in Australia, one about running out of time to achieve things in life, lots of things like that. And then next slide, it's also more photos. Um, I'm not gonna go through like every piece, but this is some of the art in our museum and some of our students making it. JD's down there on the bottom left playing guitar. <laughs> uh, okay, next slide. So if you're interested in looking at our process, anything like that, our website is mocappopup.org. Um, as this says, we're not really sure about opening to the public. We were supposed to open March 20th, but obviously with COVID, it was not safe to do so. So we're not sure when or if we will be opening, but if we do, we will post updates on both our website and then our Instagram, which is at fearitself.mocat. So yeah, thank you guys. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Anna. Uh, next up, we will have MoCo on Climate, which, is, uh, which will be presented by Swarish Day. Hi everyone, my name is Sorish Day. I am a freshman at Walter Johnson and I'm one of the co-founders of uh, MoCo Students on Climate. Next slide. So um, first to get an idea of the crisis that we're facing. So um, as many of you probably know, in 2018, the UN panel on climate change came back and told us that we have 12 years to reduce our global emissions in half to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And if we fail to do that, then there's like really terrible things which are gonna happen. And so it's very critical that we mobilize adequately to meet that target. Next slide. So Montgomery County, um, in December of 2017, the County Council, um, in one of the first declarations in the country, uh, they declared a climate emergency and they said, we'll reduce emissions 80% by 2030. So now MCPS, which is the school system, um, they get about half of the county's total budget. So really, if you want to have the total transformation, the, the school system should be playing a um, leading role. But so far, that hasn't really happened. You know, they haven't aggressively pushed for electric buses. When students want a climate strike, they say, no, we're not going to excuse your absences. The climate change education is very fragmented and incomplete and only 33% of their total energy, which is about a third, comes from renewable sources. Uh, next slide. So now, um, Moko on Climate is a group of high school students and uh, some middle school students as well from, all, from different regions of the county. And we sort of have three driving principles when we seek to make change. So the first is that um, seeking policy change where we sort of lobby, where we petition um, to seek changes, such as the ones which we have um, outlined in our online petition. And the second element of this is uh, po people power. And this is really the core of grassroots activism, which is building a movement of people who are informed and ready to organize to solve the problem. And the third one is gaining political power, where we try to uh, make our you know, government bodies more climate, fr climate friendly in terms of policy by supporting and endorsing candidates who have strong policies in that area. So like we endorse a board of education candidate, we've endorsed a congressional candidate, um, and that's how we go about that. Uh, next slide.
So our online petition is where we demand that MCPS take stronger action on climate change. And it has six key demands. Um, the first is that all of MCPS's new buildings um, will not contribute to, to any additional uh, greenhouse gas emissions. That's slightly different from carbon neutral because um, basically the difference is when you say that a building is carbon neutral, it emits just as much as um, it takes in. So like you can do offsetting where like you take in carbon uh, to make up for what you're releasing here. It's just saying you're not releasing anything. Um, and the second element is that they'll retro retrofit their buildings and report the energy use of their buildings um, beginning with the lowest uh, efficiency buildings. The third of which is that they move to make their bus fleet completely electric. And that's kind of uh, important here because buses account for about 15% of MCPS's total emissions. And the fourth of which is really unique to MCPS because they're um, an institution that educates people. They have a very unique ability to make sure that students get a proper climate change education. So our fourth demand asks them to um, incorporate climate change education throughout uh, K through 12 education, which not only talks about personal choices, but also the role of government and industry in causing this crisis itself. And the fifth of which is that um, MCPS creates a uh, climate change recommendation group that's student led and they would suggest policies that um, reduce carbon emissions. And the sixth is um, providing three excused absences for civic engagement. So this would be for things like walkouts or marches and on the left hand side, there's a QR code to the petition. So um, I'd suggest that you all uh, sign that and I'll give you a few seconds to do that. I get the next slide. Um, so on September 27th, this was a day of a, a global strike. So we rallied at the Board of Education um, to support our petition. And there's some pictures of that uh, on the bottom. Awesome, thank you so much, George. Um, is there a specific um, website or way for um, any of the participants to meet, you know, see what you're about or get more information or um, sign this petition if they haven't yet? Um, yeah, uh, this was on the first slide, but our website was there. And uh, if you want to reach out to us, our email is moco.on.climate at gmail.com. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So our last presentation today will be the Nomen Nessio project, uh, which will be presented by Srihari Ravi. So, um, hi, I'm one of the co-founders of the Nomen SEO Project, um, along with my friend Maya Teets, who um, is unable to be here today. Next slide. So, trigger warning, um, I will be making references to well-known incidents of sexual assault and harassment, although no explicit language will be used. So basically, the Nomen SEO project was, is this sort of collective of students whose um, initial goal is to use solution-oriented data analysis to encourage further initiatives um, and research from school boards, MCPS in particular, um, toward limiting and hopefully ending sexual assault and harassment among um, students, especially on-campus sexual assault and harassment, and also mitigating trauma recovery for survivors. So we aim to work with schools and conduct the survey through schools when we were initially founded, but we ran into difficulties concerning IRB approval documents and just like a lot of things that we as students aren't really able to do since most of us are under 18. So we conducted the survey over social media um, with the intention of being more conducive of further analysis, not conclusive of the state of sexual assault and harassment in MCPS. And we plan to expand our initiative um, into infographics, video-based content, um, and more education as it pertains to consent, LGBTQ-friendly um, teen sexual education, and more within the next year um, under new leadership because we plan to have um, another um, executive director take me and my position um, since we're graduating. Next slide. So basically, um, we kind of started um, cognizant of like various different incidents um, in, within Montgomery County and outside of Montgomery County. Um, in Rockville High School, an undocumented immigrant student was reported to have sexually assaulted a young girl. 
Um, and this incident was used at a White House press conference to weaponize sexual assault against undocumented immigrants. Um, although it's like, um, I don't fully know like, or understand the results of that case. Um, I thought it was kind of um, interesting how um, sexual assault was used um, as a political weapon um, when I don't believe that should be the response at all. Um, and then in Damascus High School, a student, sexual, a student was sexually assaulted in a locker room. The princi principal overseeing this incident left her job and was given another one at MCPS despite her poor conduct um, with the situation. And we also noticed like other incidents of sexual assault against girls of color around the county and around the country that go without adequate response. So my friend Maya Teeks and I started this organization, um, or I wouldn't really call it an organization, but this group um, with the goal of understanding sexual assault and harassment among students from an intersectional lens. Um, and also because like of my history working with like school integration efforts, um, and like using my personal data analysis relating to the achievement opportunity gaps in MCPS, I thought that it was really important to use data analysis in this in this instance, um, because I noticed that like facts and figures are a lot more appealing to people and help persuade people more into advocating for a cause. Next slide. So we have four goals. We first and foremost want to improve administrative responses to allegations of sexual assault and harassment by students. We also want to pass school board policies that ameliorate educational circumstances for survivors of sexual assault and harassment in schools. We want to educate students on sexual assault and harassment and we want to foster more dialogue concerning how these things affect marginalized communities. Next slide. So accomplishments, we did complete the survey over social media. We surveyed over 600 MCPS students on sexual assault and harassment from all 25 different MCPS schools, uh, high schools um, throughout February. We received our majority of our responses for student, from students of color. Um, we had adequate representation from all parts of the county, um, including um, the Down County, the Northeastern and Up County consortiums, which um, like we like, especially wanted to um, get responses from because they, they can sometimes be underrepresented in countywide initiatives. Um, and we also received over 30 responses from Damascus and over 50 from Einstein and Blair. Um, we completed all, and we worked with uh, school SGAs and um, uh, MSPs, BSUs, um, and like feminist organizations at schools and Girl Up um, to disseminate the survey and make sure that it reaches as many students as possible. Um, and we also had adequate responses from both um, like men, women, and non-binary people. We completed all data analysis as of April, and we are working toward releasing our culminating report by late April or early May. So if you follow our social media accounts, which we'll give at the end to um, see the results of the survey. Next slide. Our website is the nomenessioproject.org. Um, if you want to follow us on social media, we are at the Nomenessio Project. Although we don't really use Twitter that much, our Twitter is TNNP Tweets. Um, if you want to follow me and my individually, like in case you're looking toward like working for the, like our group, like within the next year, and you would rather reach out to us, like for those opportunities, those are our Instagrams. But we'll probably be posting about that on our like on the Nomenencio Project's Instagram. We intend on releasing our report and transitioning leadership roles by the end of April. Um, in April is Sexual Assault Survivors Month, so it's a big goal for us to complete that by this month. Um, and more opportunities for involvement will be made available over the summer, and our Instagram is the best form of contact for that. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Shuhari. Uh, so, um, the next section of this presentation will be a discussion that will be headed by, of course, Delegate Solomon. Um, it will be somewhat free flow, um, and we're, you know, hoping to make sure that every single one of you panelists are highlighted um, so that the audience will get a better understanding, um, you know, about you and about your projects. And of course, again, for the audience, if any questions do arise while um, you're hearing them speak about their uh, initiatives, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section, and we will be taking those questions at the end of the section. So um, without further ado, um, we, can, we can now begin the discussion section. 
Great, thank you, Simon. Uh, and I, I just have to say, uh, I'm incredibly impressed with uh, with the presentations. I've been involved with Communities United Against Hate and the Youth Creating Change Program since it started, um, and I've had an opportunity to interact personally with uh, with some of the projects that we uh, we got to hear presentations from. And I am uh, just um, always amazed um, and consistently impressed by the the work that you all are doing. Um, and I just wanted to, to start off by saying that. Um, so my name is Jared Solomon. I'm a delegate for District 18, so I have the pleasure of representing um, Chevy Chase, Wheaton, Kensington, and the Silver Spring area in the Maryland House of Delegates, and I'm going into, uh, or currently in my, my second year in my first term. Um, so I wanted to start off with a couple of questions, um, and, and the questions will be, some of them will be directed at all the panelists, and some of them will be directed specifically at, a, at, at one project or the other. Um, so I wanted to start off, you know, I think one of the big common threads that we have here is, is dialogue or discussion, you know, whether it's starting discussion with legislators, um, having a dialogue among community members, starting a dialogue around, you know, how high school students are feeling about certain things. So a question that I would pose to all of you is how does having healthy dialogue and conversation um, allow you to achieve your goals and, and work towards the, the things that you're all hoping to accomplish with your projects? Um. So for fear, I think that we're using a dialogue to first of all, like you have to have an open dialogue to be able to create like art about your emotions and more authentic art. But I think that also the dialogue can sort of help people understand like other people better, if that makes sense. Like there's a lot of situations that obviously all of us have witnessed in which fear is used sort of as a weapon and if you're afraid of someone there's often people putting out hate like people use fear as a political weapon and even during covid i know a lot of people are using fear of the virus to sort of um, take it out against certain communities um so i think that an open dialogue about what we fear can help to alleviate that issue and also can help to make people feel closer to their community and their fellow community members. For my project, um, which was the Mocha for Change Lobbying Day, the Gun Violence Prevention Lobbying Day. Um, so we had to have very in-depth discussions from the start of the project because seeing as it was such a coalition of different groups, we had to decide as a community what our legislative priorities were. And then we had to look at what bills were related to our legislative priorities in the House and say, okay, which ones are we going to try and champion? Um, which issues do we think have the best, ha the best possibility of passing through the House of Delegates in the, in the Senate, et cetera. And so on that end, there was a discussion just within the planning process. But in discussion with our legislators, we had to communicate, A, why we were there. So we had to be vulnerable to the set to the senators and delegates and say look here is why we care about this issue which for most high school students gun violence is a very personalized plaguing issue because we for at least our generation i know that i was in fourth grade when sandy hook happened and i was a freshman when parkland happened and just this is something that we have grown up with and i can tell you exactly where i was when each of those happened so this is something that is just very vulnerable with an it's something very personalized to our communities. And so in order to effectively communicate with our legislators, we had to say, here's why we care and here's why you should champion this on our behalf. As far as how discussions are helping my organization achieve our goal is, well, our whole goal is to have these discussions. So that's sort of our end, um, that's sort of our, that's, that is our whole purpose is um, to start these discussions and really what we're hoping to get out of these discussions more so is for people to see other perspectives around them and not only just hear what they have to say, but understand where the other people are coming from and why they hold the views that they hold. Um, also to give everybody a chance to voice their opinion and have it be heard. Um, and I think that's in doing that, that takes big steps towards building a lot of empathy within our community, which is something that I think empathy is a trait that is, it's not appreciated enough, um, outright. 
And I think empathy is the key to solving a lot, lot of problems. JD, I, uh, I would agree with you. I think we could all use a little bit more empathy in our lives. So thanks for, thanks for those comments. Thank you. Suresh or uh, Shahari, do you want to jump in before we move on? I would just say that when we look at um, an issue like climate change, one of the biggest problems with the discussion is that a lot of people don't fully grasp just how serious the situation is. So like one of our members, she's a sixth grader at Pyle, and she uh, tries to hold a weekly climate strikes like during their study hall period. And one of the things that she mentions is that these 20 minute discussions for many of those students, it's the first time that they've ever heard about what climate change really is. And so, you know, sparking that discussion where you really say, what is this issue about? What are the stakes? Why do we need to do something about it now? Once people realize that, I think they care a lot more about it. So thanks for that, everybody. Um, and so another another question, um, and this I'm going to direct it at three specific organizations. So, um, you know, a lot of you have talked about working to create substantive change with elected officials, whether it's, you know, in Annapolis, um, working on gun violence, whether it's with the school board um, and county council on climate change, or whether it's, you know, specifically with the school board or within DC, uh, MCPS with the Nomenesio project. So I guess for those three organizations, what's the best way to engage that you've found in those substantive conversations um, to push for change with elected officials at all different levels? So what I've personally found is that face-to-face -face contact is by far the most effective because you are able to go in there and like I said earlier, say, here's why I'm here, here's why I care, here's why you need to argue for this on behalf of all of your constituents. So that face-to-face -face contact is very important. But on top of that, what I've also found to be effective is almost flooding their offices with emails and phone calls and just getting anyone who's passionate about the issue to say, hey, you have to vote in favor of this. Hey, you have to vote in favor of this. I have six people in my house. We support this. You're, we're your constituents, et cetera. And just really getting that, putting that pressure on as much as you can in addition to the friendly, hi, hello, I'm Lauren. I'm lobbying you today. <laughs> Um, something I've noticed personally is like um, the issue isn't even like worrying about like the officials like disagreeing with you at least like in like local politics just because Montgomery County is already so progressive Um, the issue is that they don't know that it's a priority of their constituents so I find that like petitioning um, individual conversation um, and just like other efforts like that to show that it's um, in, like the issue in question is like important to not only the con um, constituents of today, but also future constituents, younger generations and students like myself and others. Um, that's kind of what encourages elected officials to take action on a particular issue. That's a great point, Shrihari. Thank you. I would just say that well, one of there are sort of two really important elements, and the first of which is that uh, you're very clear about what you're asking. So, you know, um, so that way the elected official knows exactly what your group is going for. And the second of which is to show that you have sort of a movement of people behind you. So as Lauren was saying, you know, flooding emails, flooding phone um, phone lines. So like uh, we participated in a mass calling on Earth Day where we flooded. Uh, Senator Cardin's office with phone calls and then like before the September climate strike, we flooded the board email box with emails asking for excused absences for that. So that really, you know, it, it may not require something to happen, but next time you see an official, they'll say, oh yeah, you're the guys who flooded our email box. And they sort of acknowledge that you do um, have a lot of people that support you. Thanks, Suresh. Um, so this is another question that's open to all of our panelists here. So in one form or another, some of you touched on briefly some of the obstacles that, um, that your organizations ran into. Um, and I'm just curious if you could speak to, you know, what some of the resistance or obstacles that your, your groups have run into and how, um, you know, planning allowed you to get over it and, and what you did to, to, get, to get through them. But I can go if no one else is going to go. Thanks, Anna. Um, so I'm going to set aside the obstacle of COVID 
just because it's pretty clear why it was an obstacle and we haven't gotten over it because it's not that simple. Um, but an obstacle that we had that was minor, but definitely like, I guess had an effect on what we were doing was that there was an article in Bethesda magazine about what we were doing, which was not an obstacle. It was wonderful that they put an article in there, but there were quite a few comments that were like these like snowflakes talking about their fears as if they have real problems. Like they've never been to war. They don't know hardship. And while a lot of us appreciate that we are privileged to grow up in Bethesda and that we obviously have not had the worst problems in the whole world, I think it was sort of disheartening to some of us because I think that for some of our participants, it made them feel like my problems aren't worth worrying about. Um, and so we had, we went to Bowie Monger, all of like our leaders and a lot of our artists. And we basically like, we had mute live music and we ate dinner together and we like talked about it. JD was there. He played some music. It was great. And it sort of helped us get back together and sort of realize that just because someone and the other people also have problems doesn't mean that it's not important to be vulnerable and to express the issues you have. Um, so, yeah. Um, you know, Lauren, maybe I'll, I'll ask you a direct question. Um, you know, I, I, we know that there's a diversity of political views in, uh, you know, in MCPS among student leaders. Did you get any pushback on, have you gotten any pushback on uh, MoCo for Change's work on, uh, on gun safety? So I attend pools. I live in Olney, Maryland, but I attend Poolsville High School for the Global Ecology Studies program. So at Poolsville, there is such a diversity of political opinions because Poolsville is a very rural conservative area, but you have kids coming from all over the county, from all different religious, ethnic groups, etc. And so in that regard, <laughs> yes, um, MoCo for Change definitely is very popular with some groups and very unpopular with others. Um, but the way that we deal with that as an organization is there's always going to be more people, well, at least because we're in Montgomery County, so it is a liberal area. We realize that there are always going to be more people who are in favor of our work than the vocal haters <laughs> in that regard. And so what we've been doing is we've been recruiting at school branches to really have this grassroots initiative to get people who are interested at a very accessible level to them. So if they can't make it to the meetings that we have in Rockville or Bethesda, they can do it at their school in Burtonsville or Poolsville. Um, so really making it accessible at all the schools that we can. And that's how we counter that, just by reaching out to the people who we know want to do it and giving them that opportunity. Great, thank you, Lauren. Um, so this is a, another question for, for all the panelists here. So um, in addition, obviously, as we talked about some of the diverse views within MCPS, I, I imagine you all have uh, a diversity of views within your own organizations. So when you're trying to build an agenda or you know, focus on issues or you know, literally Anna just picking what kind of exhibits you wanna display at the museums, how do you navigate internal dynamics um, with your own organizations to build consensus and, and come up with, uh, with a you know, cohesive plan of, uh, of action? Well, because we are, we are largely, we're apolitical, um, we, and sort of an attempt to make the space of our discussions as neutral as possible. So we never, within our leadership, we never really had any big um, internal issues about what we're going to do or how we're going to do it. I think our biggest issues have been um, where and like, where should we go? How much time should we spend here? Should we keep the tent up longer or whatnot? So due to uh, uh, my organization being apolitical, we've had a little bit less of those issues. With MoCo Students for Change and our lobbying day, there was much disagreement about which legislation to focus on. Like, I'll be the first to admit, um, when we were planning what legislation we were planning to do, I was very against arguing for ghost guns. 
because at the time there was not a bill that was discussing this. So we would have been asking them to write a new bill. And also I'm like, we have not seen gun violence used with ghost guns. So I realized that it's a preventative measure, but it's a far off preventative measure. So I was arguing against that, but as a group, we had a discussion about it. And so people, some people's opinions changed, including my own. And then we took a vote because at the end of the day, it's very rare to get a unanimous opinion, but you give everybody their chance to make their case. Cause realistically, if you're opposed to it, you probably have a good reason to be, but it's just how much the group approves or disapproves of that opinion. And you just have to go full speed ahead. You can't let one thing stop the full motion of the actual project. Um, so for us, we have had a lot of like what JD was talking about, more logistical arguments and issues, um, especially because we're both student led, but we're also like, it's not like we have a president and a vice president. We just have a group of students that are all interested, which most of the time is amazing because we can get a ton of different people's opinions and it doesn't feel like there's one person, you know, shoving their opinion down everyone's throat. But some of the time it's frustrating because it's hard to be productive when you have, you don't want to prioritize any one person's opinion. But I would say that we, like Lauren was saying, we try to just have a discussion about it and call a vote and also make sure that like, if, for example, we decide to do something and there's a group of people that were voting that we didn't do it and they didn't want it, we try to make sure that we are addressing why they didn't want it and trying to help them and like make sure that they don't feel like it was personal. Um, and I think that that's important because a lot of problems, a lot more problems arise when people feel that something is targeted at them personally. Um, but yeah. All right. Well, I think we've got time for one more question before we open up to audience questions. Um, so this, again, will be a question uh, directed at all the panelists, although probably a little bit more relevant to some than others. Um, so I know, you know, each of your organizations have a real range of, of, uh, of grades represented uh, or ages. I know um, Suresh, the MoCo um, climate goes literally down the middle in elementary school. But for those of you that are, um, are graduating or going to, you know, graduating maybe with this year or next year, how are you working to cultivate leaders within your organization so that, you know, your mission continues even after you leave um, and that there's a, you know, continuity of, of ideas and, and thought to, to help get things through? Like I mentioned in my um, initial presentation, next year, hopefully, if we're in school, we're going to start a club at BCC and then um, give them all the resources and materials that they need. And um, sort of our main focus with that club will, to be, get, will be to get younger um, leadership and younger participants so they can have all the resources that they need and they can pass it down as well. So with Mo I am a junior at Poolsville, but with MoCo for Change, one of our presidents is currently graduating. And so on that note, the way MoCo for Change addresses that secession is, so in each of our individual branches, we are working with each of them individually to have meetings, to learn about the culture of the club, how big it is, et cetera, to determine whether they're having elections or whether there's just kind of a board because there aren't that many people in the club, et cetera. So we're working with each individual chapter to determine the culture at that school to determine what's appropriate for the secession in that atmosphere. But for the parent organization, we always have so many cool initiatives going on, whether it's the lobbying days or the protests or the vigils, like we always have these cool events going on. And so there's always leadership opportunities in that regard. And we have an exec team of, I think it's 19 people, not all of them are seniors. And so that being said, we also have natural leaders within the organization who have taken up leadership positions within these projects. So that being said, that is how we foster our secession because everyone grows as an activist in what with MoCo for change. And so you have a bunch of qualified children who are willing to champion these issues. And we have elections at the end of each year to determine the new leadership team. 
So not to interrupt, but we'll have, we have time for one more answer, not question, but one more answer from one of the panelists for this specific question. And then we can move on to, um, we're actually going to do question. We're going to switch it up and actually do questions for, um, Delegate Solomon before we get into questions from the audience. Um, just so that we, we sort of maintain this, this conversation that we have now. Um, and then we'll get to those at the very end. Um, so for those in the audience, just keep in mind, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q and A section and we will get to them. Um, it might, it actually would be better to do them as you keep, like, as you have the questions rather than waiting for this section, um, so that you can just get your idea down. Um, so thank you. Um, and so, yeah, so one more answer and then we can move on to the second section of that. Thank you. And if nobody has any questions for Delegate Solomon, then we can move into um, audience questions, which we do have a couple prepared. Um, well, Simon, the, the one thing I would just jump in um, to add is, you know, I think sometimes um, people are hesitant to reach out to their elected officials, um, you know, until they have a specific ask or there's a specific issue that they want to focus on. And, and I would just encourage, you know, all the panelists who probably don't need the encouragement, but the folks who are watching the panel, um, please reach out to us. I mean, honestly, I will tell you, I think some of us struggle actually with the best way to get a hold of, you know, we really want to engage high school students. We really want to engage youth, um, you know, in the county and in Maryland. And we honestly struggle, um, you know, sometimes to figure out the, the best person to contact or what organizations are there. So I would just encourage you all, um, you know, if you have ideas, if you have questions, I mean, you know, the, the folks um, when, when MoCo for Change came down to Annapolis, um, you know, I, I got on the phone a couple of times with uh, with people to sort of talk through issues and and help prepare for for the lobby day. But um, you know, I, I know I've been invited to Moco uh, Moco for Climate's events um, and talk to some of their organizers. But we all, particularly in Annapolis, work on a variety of different pieces of legislation that I think a lot of your groups would be really interested in in helping and supporting. Um, and so I would just encourage everybody, please reach out to us. Um, I will share uh, my contact information, my phone number, my email address. Um, you know and Obviously, it's hard to hard to meet in person for the foreseeable future, but usually uh, under normal circumstances, we're all out and about in the community pretty regularly. So um, please, please reach out. Um, Delegate Solomon, on that note, I actually have a question. Sure. So I, in addition to my role with MoCo for Change, I also serve with a bunch of other organizations such as Amnesty International, Generation Gratify, et cetera. And the, wor the words being thrown amongst a lot of these organizations recently are the words, gen I mean, virtual lobbying. And I wanted to know what your experiences have been with that during the coronavirus pandemic and how frequently you've seen that been used as a tool so far. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, we're all kind of uh, adapting uh, on the fly, you know, building, building the car sort of as we drive it down the road. Um, so our, our District 18 team has done a series of, um, you know, Zoom webinars or town halls. We had one a couple of weeks ago with, um, with Congressman Raskin and, and Senator Van Hollen. Um, and just kind of talk about issues during session. Um, you know, it, it, at this point, that's really the only way that you can do it. So, you know, we're all probably monitoring our email more closely than ever before, um, you know, and, and, and engaging online. So I think that that is absolutely effective. You know, I think the best way to do it, I would suggest is if you are going to, you know, to do virtual lobbying, whether, you know, on a Zoom town hall or via, via email or social media, is to just make it authentic. Um, you know, for a lot of people, it's really easy to just click on a mass email that's sent out, you know, that says contact your representative here. Um, and we get a lot of those, but it's, um, it's a lot harder to ignore and a lot more effective if, you know, you take five minutes out to write a personal note to say, you know, I had a loved one that was impacted by gun violence, or, you know, this is why it's so important to me that, that we, you know, we, we, you know, focus on renewable energy so that we have a, you know, clean environment and, and a healthy climate in Maryland or, you know, I have a, a loved one or I've been impacted by, by sexual assault, um, you know, and this is why I want to see these, these laws changed. It's really, really impactful when we hear personal stories. So, um, you know, again, with what we're dealing with, we obviously can't meet in person. So whether it's a phone call or, or an email, just making sure that it's, it's authentic is really helpful. Thank you so much, Delegate Solomon. Thank you for that question, um, Lauren. So before I move on, just last call, if anybody has any other questions for Delegate Solomon. Um, if not, again, he mentioned before, just feel free to reach out. Um, it definitely can be, I guess there's a stigma around reaching out to your elected officials and it can be a little bit intimidating, but they're definitely, I mean, I, I guess it, he's displayed, you know, he's a real person. Um, um, and I'm sure all of the other representatives are, are similar. Um, 
But so moving on to the last section of um, today's um, presentation, um, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, the first one from Olivia uh, is, I know some of you have touched a little bit on this previously, but how has YCC been helpful in expanding your network of fellow social change activists? And have your peers been able to help continue slash spread your discussion? Um, and this is directed for all of you. So, um, you know, feel free to jump in at any point in time. I would just, um, you know, I think one of the best things about YCC is just that um, there's so many different uh, student groups uh, in this county that fight for so many great social justice issues. Like that's being displayed here where we have like organizations fighting gun violence um lack of uh civil discussions and so when you're sort of connecting all those activists together they can now funnel their energy more effectively because they know that you know they all exist and they can work together so i think that's one of the most uh unique and helpful things about ycc mm -hmm. i definitely think maybe there's like a an air of intersectionality that's just sort of created just from being in that room because there's so many people working on so many different initiatives um which is true. So you don't necessarily need to be um, aligned directly in what your initiatives are to be supporting supporting each other, um, which is definitely true because a lot of these social injustices are connected in some way or another. Um, so good, great sentiment, uh, Soresh. Yeah, if anybody else has an answer, feel free. Um, if not, we can move on to the next question. Um, oh, sorry, JD, did you want to go? No, it's all you. All right. Um, this is really quick, but they've helped us in expanding the network. Obviously, we found a lot of students from other schools when most of our initial people starting on MoCat were from BCC. And so that really helped us. Like we wanted to obviously represent different schools. And like a lot of our artists ended up coming from YCC. Um, and then they're, they've been really helpful in like their trainings have helped us a lot with like making a website and things like that, that might seem simple, but I don't know the way that they explained them and helped us grow. And we like started going to YCC before we had any project at all. So they really helped us get off the ground. And then they really helped us with like grant funding as well in terms of like art supplies and things that are expensive. JD, do you want to say anything before we move on or? Yeah, so definitely something that's that YCC has helped connecting cultures with that is um, that we can't thank you guys enough for is the networking opportunities. I was able to speak at MCR at an MCR meeting because of y'all. Um, and further than that, just the um, bi weekly meetings. Um, and trainings where I get to interact with all these other organizations um, and meet other groups that are doing similar, that have similar initiatives. Um, that's, that was a huge help um, in really sort of branching out and broadening our networks and our horizons to what other people are doing in the county and who else we can work with. Awesome. Thanks, JD. Um, to continue for the next question, um, one from Caden, uh, what is a piece of advice that you would give to those who are interested in starting or joining some social initiative um, or, you know, starting their own project? Uh, and this is again directed towards everyone. So uh, feel free to jump in. I'm sure you guys have advice to give since you guys are seasoned. Um, <laughs> of course, you guys have all have your own projects. So. I think it depends on the social issue you're trying to fight against. Like, obviously, um, with things like de facto segregation, that's extremely like local. Um, but I would say, in general, um, the best way to get involved, like with an issue if you're just starting out, is start with like your school or like your just general community, um, instead of like branching out to like larger like state or like national level. Um, issues just because um, it's often easier to understand an issue and putting it in the local perspective. Um, and I would also say like work with older um, organizers and activists because they could um, provide very like 
good advice since most of like the issues we're fighting against today have been fought um, against before. I would like to add that while if you're considering this, you probably are an incredibly capable human being, that everyone is better with a team behind them, with a team and coalition. And so I would try and recommend getting yourself a leadership team or delegating based on the snowflake structure, just so that you have a support system so that everybody always has something different to bring to the table. You might have a great idea, but someone else be, might be able to add to that to make your idea go from 100% to 200%. Um, so I would just recommend getting that leadership team together so that you yourself can brainstorm and get together a really solid, cohesive project. And then from there, you can take on the big guys. <laughs> but <laughs> you, need, you need a team behind you in order to do that. Thank you, Lauren. That was a great uh, question. I actually, for in the interest of time, I, I do want to move on to another question um, from uh, Luca and Jillian. Um, we are all aware of the negative aspects of society that this pandemic has unearthed. How do you feel that this, that this time has allowed us to engage in positive discussion, or I guess more positive discussion? Um, what are your ideas for how this time can be used to propel our initiatives and give us momentum? So in terms of like using it to propel your initiative, it's definitely a time like no other where you have time to plan and you can get on Zoom calls. And I definitely think that even if you can't, I mean, some people's initiatives can still, I guess, do their action, but even if you can't, it's important to keep planning and keep people's interest. And um, in terms of discussion, I think that it's like an interesting time because you're able to sort of reflect on your project and take a minute. And I think that that definitely provides like a unique opportunity to think about how you can expand and how you can grow. I would like to add that right now is a time when everyone is stuck at home. And so in that regard, they are feeling cooped up. They want to do something. And all these organizations have this amazing opportunity right now to take advantage of that energy. So for example, this group Generation Ratify right now has been having phone banking and text banking every single night. And they have unprecedented amount of teenagers who suddenly want a phone bank each night just because they can't, because these opportunities are made available to them. Um, and they've got nothing better to do, so they want to do this. Um, how much Netflix can you binge? I mean, it really, people have the time to do something and they have the energy to do something. So it's a really great time to take advantage of that. Awesome. Uh, we can take one last answer on this question before I move on. If, if any. Um, if not, we can go on to, um, there's a question for MoCAD specifically, um, which is essentially saying, what is the plan for next year um, for MoCAD and um, whether or not, you know, you plan on reinstating the fear exhibit if, it, if it's not, um, if it doesn't end up happening this year or will you try to do something else? Um. I wish I could say with 100% certainty, I don't know for sure, but we are hoping on whenever it's safe to open that we would be able to. Um, obviously, there's some problems with a lot of the art is done by seniors and we don't wanna have a museum if the seniors can't come to it because they'll be in college. Um, I would say that the worst case scenario is that we video the entire museum and we put it on our website and we share it um, but we would obviously love to have people in the space because being surrounded by the art is definitely a unique experience. And as far as I know, we plan to have a separate, a new MoCAT next year with a new theme as we've been going in our progression. Obviously that depends upon things like grant funding and leadership and stuff, but we don't, we're not going to open this a year from now. We're either going to probably open it in the next I don't know, before colleges start up, whenever that may be, whether it be halfway through first semester or at the beginning of first semester, um, or we're probably not going to open to like a large public. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, the next question we have is specifically for Connecting Cultures from Sophia. Um, she asks, how is the organization working on expanding communication to include students from less affluent areas? 
What is the plan or is there a plan to go beyond BCC and receive input from the diverse communities surrounding Bethesda? So right now we aren't BCC tied um, because our, the bulk of our um, project happened over the summer. So we weren't tied to the school or, um, but we did focus on the BCC community and sort of one thing that we um, looked at was the difference in diversity between Bethesda and Silver Spring, um, because those are the two main areas that BCC pulls from. And when we were doing our spin art, we, um, we sort of, when we had our spin art in Bethesda um, and the squares we got from that, at juxtaposed to the squares that we got from when we did our spin art in Silver Spring, we saw a clear difference in diversity um, that was, it was sort of like, and that was another way to sort of start that discussion of why is there this difference of diversity um, and then bringing it back to the socioeconomic barriers that are in place within the county. Um, as far as the plan to grow beyond BCC, we, um, we want to work with other organizations, like I mentioned before, like Safety at WJ. And our whole project is inspired by John Landsman and his study circles initiative from MCPS's equity and equity initiatives um, uh, at central office. So I know that they train almost every high school, a group of high schoolers and teachers from almost every high school to run these study circles with the hope that they'll bring them back to the high school. So we are hoping to get in closer contact with John Landsman and the students and teachers that he trains all across the county so we can sort of, again, broaden our network and reach the whole of the county. Awesome. Uh, thank you, JD. So I think I'm going to go on and have two more questions. Um, one for Delegate Solomon and then one for all of the panelists to round off this discussion. Um, and unfortunately, we weren't able to get all of our questions answered today. But again, um, I'm sure everyone here, all the panelists are open to discussing with you or answering any questions you might have. Um, and they have listed their uh, information and details. Um, and, and also might be possible for us to send out any of this information after the meeting. And, I can talk with Ethan about that afterwards. But um, so the next, the second to last question for Delegate Solomon is, uh, what are elected officials doing this time period? I mute myself there. Um, so, you know, we're, we're doing what we can. Um, you know, for the General Assembly, we're in a little bit of a unique position because we're adjourned. Um, so we, uh, we run a 90 day session uh, at the beginning of the year from January through April. Um, we adjourned early this year for the first time since the Civil War. Um, and so our role right now is more sort of oversight and connection and, um, you know, and communication because we can't pass any new legislation. Um, we passed a couple of emergency bills before the end of the session, um, you know, to, to put money into, into a COVID fund to give the governor certain, um, certain powers. But once we adjourned, we're, we're really limited. So the county council has been able to, um, you know, to convene virtually and they've passed a couple of great pieces of legislation. Um, but for me personally, you know, it's a lot of oversight. Um, I serve on the appropriations committee. Um, so my, my committee oversees the budget um, specifically for the education sector, um, commerce and labor. So, you know, this week we've been working really closely with childcare organizations, um, you know, to, to work with MSCE and the Department of Commerce to make sure that they were getting what they needed to support um, their centers and that community. You know, we've held a number of different town halls, as I mentioned earlier, to get information out to people. Um, our office has been really focused on working with, um, with folks in the Hispanic community and the undocumented community. So we've been doing a series of, you know, of videos and communications in Spanish so that everybody, you know, is able to access information that's out there. We've been, you know, working with a lot of constituents and people who have questions and, and are having trouble, you know, navigating the different systems that have been set up to, to support businesses and families. Um, we're just trying to, you know, help where we can, um, but our legislative role is, is really limited because we're, we're not in session. Thank you. Um, there was actually another question Ethan um, wanted you to answer from, sure. from Sophia who uh, asks, uh, what is Delegate Solomon doing or planning to do to advocate for slash support student initiatives like these 
um, whether it's funding resources or um, hosting future events? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so, you know, I've been involved with uh, with CUA and YCC since really the beginning, um, and I got the opportunity. I guess it was last year to act as the MC for the the big uh, annual fundraiser for YCC, and and it was wonderful. It was great to see all the projects and organizations that are being supported, and and really help rally the community around it. Um, you know, in Annapolis, uh, a lot of the issues that you all are raising. Um, you know, I'm I'm not a high school student anymore, but I'm not that old. Um, a lot of the issues that you all are raising are really important to me as well. Um, we've hosted a number of organizations in Annapolis, um, you know, really to, to make sure that we're representing the ideas of all of our constituents of all ages. Um, and, you know, again, I would invite you all to reach out to me. Um, you know, I mentioned in the chat, which I hope uh, all the attendees were able to get. If not, I'll make sure it gets sent out um, following up. You know, we get some of the best ideas of things that we want to work on from our constituents. It's a blessing and a curse of representing such a, a really diverse and uh, and intelligent community. Um, but, you know, I, I have a couple of bills this, this past session that, that specifically dealt with a lot of these issues, um, particularly one actually that would have uh, required all of our school systems to essentially maintain an annual dashboard of all of their energy consumption with uh, hope of getting to a certain set of goals around climate change that would allow, um, you know, really allow, especially at the local level for us to be pushing these kind of issues. Um, I was a founder actually of Marylanders to Prevent Gun Violence. So the, uh, the issue that Lauren and her colleagues are working on really, um, you know, is, is personal to me for a lot of the students I worked with in Baltimore. Um, but again, I would invite you all, um, you know, whether uh, the panelists or, or folks on the, on the Zoom to please reach out to me. Um, you know, if there's stuff that, that you want us to be focused on, um, you know, we have nine months before our next session starts. And now is really the time where we start cultivating and, and, uh, and thinking through ideas for the, for the coming session. Thank you. Thank you for that answer, Dylan Solomon. Um, and again, yeah, we'll make sure to get that information sent out um, to everyone who joined, if possible. Um, and so the last question, it's directed for all the panelists, is um, when did you notice your efforts pay off? Um, and what showed you that? Or if you haven't seen this yet, then uh, how, what, how, uh, where do you think you still have some um, room to improve, essentially? So I would like to start this one off. So I, like I said, for MoCo for Change, we did the lobbying day. But our organization structure was very, very unique in the sense that I think we had 14, 14 group leaders and each group leader had five, had a team of five that they themselves were going to train to lobby and then go on to lobby the two offices that they were assigned. And it was really exciting for me because in my group, I had a bunch of lobbying newbies. None of them had lobbied, so I got to train them from scratch, and it was very, very exciting. Um, and what's exhilarating about that is that I've since seen the two people, that, I mean, two of the people that were in my group that had never lobbied before get assigned high up positions at assorted liberal gun violence prevention organizations locally. So that's really exciting because that means that our leadership training was effective. Um, whether or not the legislation that we proposed all passed is was not the whole goal of the issue. Our goal was getting our goal was also training these students. And like I said, we've seen that this training was effective and also just gargantuan leaps and confidence in lobbying from our first time, our first meeting to our second meeting. So we just saw we just saw our activists grow and develop with this project and it was really beautiful. That's, that's amazing. Um, that's a great insight. Lauren. It's definitely not always just about the destination. It's also just about, you know, you're equipping people with the tools they need to go and make that change. And even if, you know, unfortunately something, you know, your lobbying day isn't as effective when it comes to, um, you know, the, the legislation, you're still coming out with something valuable, um, which is, which is really powerful. Um, does anybody else want to answer? Uh, I can go. So we obviously, I haven't like fully seen, I guess, us succeed technically because we haven't had our museum, but sort of like what Lauren was talking about, that's not our whole goal. Um, and something for me that was a huge success is the community that we've created and that I've seen so many people who come to MoCat become friends with people just through MoCat um, and that's like something that I thought was really important because high school can obviously feel very clicky and it's easy to feel like you can't reach out to people that are I guess outside of your circle of friends but I think that 
projects like these that get people really passionate and really inspired are definitely a way that people can meet others. And like after the first few mocats, maybe myself and one friend would go get pizza afterwards. And by the last few, we would all be going out to dinner together or hanging out. And I thought that that was a really cool success um, that happened along the way. Katie? I think something that, um, something that really was a, a moment of like, whoa, we did this was when people started texting myself and Tasneem, are you guys working with connecting cultures? Like as if they were some big organization that we were working with and not that we had started um, because I, th I think we did a really good job of presenting this really professional um, look and not making it see we didn't put ourselves in the forefront but of all the posts and whatnot but we would be in there as if we looking as if we were working for this big organization so getting people to sort of say oh are you working with them it's like how do i join and it was like that was that was pretty cool um but yeah Awesome. Um, any last one? Any last insights from anyone? Mm -hmm. um, so with me personally, like, I think I saw um, the most support come like, through the survey itself, we had a section for additional questions or comments. Um, and a lot of people said, like, thank you for doing this. Like, we really appreciate it. So I think like those anonymous acts of support. Um, are always like really helpful. And um, we also got a lot of constructive criticism, which I appreciated. Awesome. Um, any, anybody else? Um, awesome. Okay, um, so unfortunately that is all the time we have today. We actually ran over a little bit. Um, so this um, concludes uh, the first panel of, I guess this month's uh, social change fair. Um, maybe Ethan, if you'd like to come on and speak a little bit about what might be happening in the coming weeks um, before we conclude. Yeah, of course. Um, Simon, I, yeah, I think I'm, I'm on right now. So this was the first panel, um, our April 26th YCC Sparking Discussions panel. Next week, we'll be holding our social empowerment panel on May 2nd at the same time slot. And then our opportunity to get panel as well, featuring um, some more incredible activists um, and connecting them with Vice President of the Board of Education, Brenda Wolf, for the Opportunity Gap panel, and then the President of Montgomery College, uh, Dr. Pollard. So we're going to have some really, really um, substantive conversations surrounding two uh, prevalent issue areas next week, um, and we'll keep you all tuned with more information so that you can join those panel discussions as well. Um, but thank you all so much for joining here today to listen to Delegate Solomon and some of our really incredible YCC fellows speak on their issues and what they're doing to address them within the community. Yeah, um, thank you everyone uh, for joining. So I think that is everything for today. Uh, so I, uh, I believe, you know, at this point, you guys can leave at this point unless there's some uh, policy we have or something we have in place for meeting this goal. And we just want to give a big thank you to all the fellows who joined um, and other activists on this panel and Delegate Solomon, especially for taking his time to engage with some of the youth who are making incredible change within our community.